Lance Hatch, March the 17th, 1968. The first big saloon car race of the season is underway. This was the first of the guard-sponsored events. Muir is away to a good start to the race and a good start to the season, while Alfred Gardner and Hobbs battle for second place. A couple of white knuckle moments for Hobbs. Muir's car this year is the same one as he ran last year. Then it was supercharged. But this year, they've done away with the supercharger and fitted Gurney Westlake cylinder heads. Over 400 horsepower is claimed, and they've done a lot of improvement work on the suspension over the winter. Smokers on the track. That's Tony Dean in the Cortina, and John Fitzpatrick in the Escort. The Escort introduced to the public as a brand new car in January, making its competition debut. You're on his winning way, already beginning to lap the back marker. This was to be a race in two parts, each one of 20 laps and the result based on the aggregate time. Tony Dean still smoking and into the pits with a punctured rear tyre. And the mechanics set about changing it. Now if the mechanics can change it in time and Dean can finish, he gets another chance in the second heat. Now it's David Hobbs in the blue and orange falcon in the pits with falling oil pressure. And out again with instructions to take it easy and finish. John Ewer's Mustang in as well. That's Jackie Oliver's car that went so well last year. Malcolm Wayne with the only racing Chevrolet Camaro in the country. Hobbs pedaling it very gently. John Rhodes in the green and white works Mini Cooper. The two blue and white imps making one of their infrequent appearances this season. There's Gardner in the red and gold Alan Mann Cortina. Now Mann had planned to run an escort, but the twin cam version wasn't yet homologated. So he fielded out one of last year's Cortinas as a stopgap. Muir wins the first half of the race. They line up again for the second heat, and they're away. Muir into the lead again, and there's Alfred Gardner Hobbs, Brian Robinson in the Cortina, and the two works Mini Coopers as they go up into Druids for the first time. Already Muir is putting that 400 horsepower to good use. Elford managing to keep the two-litre Porsche in front of two of the Falcons. This was the first important international of the year, and many of the cars were out in competition for the first time. Many of the drivers are getting used to their new mounts, and some of them also coming to terms with brands. Muir has the advantage of knowing his car and its vices from the previous season. The imp of Alan Jones decides it's had enough for the day. Willie Kay's Cortina being passed on the outside of the apex. And there's Rhodes with his spectacular opposite lock style. We asked John to explain his driving technique of the Mini. The front wheel drive car is a very, very safe vehicle when you have the 70, 75 horsepower. But what you must remember is the power that I have means that the road wheels, the steering wheels and the driving wheels have so much power that uh, my steering wheels are spinning. Consequently, I have no steering, so I, I must steer the car from the rear. Consequently, I always put the car in as if it was going to spin, and then power myself out from the front. It's quite easy once you're in it. Now, a slow look at them, so we can see the different approach and exit lines that the cars and drivers have to this 40 mile an hour corner. Front engines, rear engines, some run wide, some clip the apex.
and a dramatic finish to the race. Muir, with a deflated rear tyre, just manages to get to the line in front of Elford. A brave move by Elford trying the outside, while Muir was fighting to control the lumbering falcon. A kiss for his wife, Jean, and up onto the rostrum to collect his garland. No, it's not Rolls-Royce making their debut in saloon car racing. It's Muir on his lap of honour. And could that be the winner jetting his way to Switzerland to bank his winnings? Not really. It's the RAF's acrobatic Red Arrows putting on a special display. On Good Friday at Snatterton for the longest race of the year. 500 kilometres of racing, just over 300 miles on the flat open 2.7 mile Norfolk circuit. A qualifying run for the European Championship. One of the biggest and most international entries we've seen in this country for a long time. The Fiat's and Alphas from Italy, the Porsches from Germany, BMW from Austria and Dutchmen and Englishmen making up the 42 starters. It's an indie style rolling start following the pace car because of the large field. A normal grid start would be too difficult. And they're away. Immediately into the lead goes Elford in the Porsche followed by John Ewer's Mustang and a whole colourful host of Minis, Alphas, Porsches and BMWs. Alfred pulls out a useful lead on the first lap. Still three and a half hours of racing to go. Gardner in the Group 2 Cortina in third place. Two of the amazing dancing little Fiat Alberts, driven by Dutchman Ab Goodemans and Toyne Hazelmans. If Ewer's boot flew open, they could both hop in and he'd never know. After 21 laps, Alfred's Porsche breaks a piston and is wheeled away into the dead car park. Into the lead with Alfred out goes the Ewer Mustang, driven by Sid Fox at this stage. Down the very fast Norwich Strait, the blue and orange Mustang hits over 140 miles an hour, frightening holidaymakers on the parallel road to the Broads. The biggest car in the race. Into the pits now for the first of its routine refueling stops and driver changes. Watch out, petrol's too expensive to waste. A nifty pit stop and away again with Ewer at the wheel. Rudimentary, easily understood pit signals for the BMW team. Obviously, they have money to burn. Questa brings in his BMW for a driver change and refueling as the Alpha pulls out. And number one driver vacates. Out that away and turn right at the top. Terry Hunter using up a lot of road at that hairpin with his privately entered Porsche. In a long distance race like this, all the drivers have their own ideas about conserving tyre rubber. Peter Lay. That was a near one. But he's away again, all under control. Roddy Harvey Bailey in the Alpha. Airpin Italian style. The leading Mustang just lapping Hunter's Porsche, which is now up to third place.
And there it is, a welcome sight after 300 miles and 115 laps of racing. The checkered flag. It's John Ewer with his co-driver Sid Fox. The winners by two clear laps from the Porsche of Owen Kramer and Fritz Pesch. John Ewer steps out of a sticky seat. In the red jacket, a happy Sid Fox. The laurel wreath goes to Ewer. An unexpected victory for what is basically a four-year-old motor car. That's a well-deserved one. Over now to Mallory Park for another race in two parts. Once again, a qualifying event for the all-important British Saloon Car Championship. The big bangers are the first away. And Gardner muffs the start from the middle of the front row, allowing Muir to storm away into what has now become his customary lead. Roy Pierpoint's Falcon leads Peter Arundel in the second Allen Man Escort. Mallory is a short 1.3 mile circuit. Jared's Bend, a very tricky everlasting right-hander. And the tight hairpin up at Shores. But despite its small size, Mallory is a fast circuit and Muir in this race is lapping at an average speed of 90 miles per hour. And Gardner now beginning to make up for his muff start, closing up on his teammate Arundel. And there's Muir through the elbow, followed by Pierpoint, who was fooled by threatening rain before the start and fitted wet tyres. Not so good in the dry. There's Gardner, 103, past Arundel, closing on Pierpoint. Tony Dean tries to get inside David Hobbs, but the superior power of the Falcon scores. Gardner, having overtaken Pierpoint, is now really working to close that gap on Muir. On a tight, crowded circuit, he's having to use every trick he knows. Muir at the hairpin, arms flailing as he works away at the wheel. Gardner really closing now. Muir gets a break as they lap a back marker. And into the last lap at the hairpin. And Gardner tries the outside and it doesn't work. And Muir makes it to the line by just two cars lengths from Gardner, who had the satisfaction of making a new circuit record during this fantastic chase. And we're away now for the second 20 lap heat for the two smaller classes. It's the two broad speed escorts on the front row with one of the works minis. Into the first lap, it's Rhodes with his teammate Steve Neal leading the pack. There's Rhodes again with this unique style of his of looking at the infield with his elbow in the air. John Fitzpatrick takes his 1300cc fuel injected escort past Rhodes and into the lead and begins to pull away lap by lap. Fitzpatrick, a man at work at the hairpin. And this was a terrific dice in this race. Neil in the works car 116 and Peter Leg, a privateer 124 with his lights on, coming along the outside. Leg on carburetors while Neil has the advantage of the eight port head and fuel injection. Fitzpatrick coming through the back markers. A blue flag, unchallenged now as he romps away from the rest of the field. Teammate Chris Craft went out on the fourth lap with damaged steering. There's the flag and Fitzpatrick wins. Rhodes in second place and not yet in sight.
It's Brands Hatch at Grand Prix time. The contestants gather again for another round of the championship. And everyone here for the Grand Prix. Formula Ones, Formula Threes, and the inevitable ladies in the paddock. And they come in all shapes and sizes. And there's the crowded grid. Amongst the 60,000 spectators were the Duke of Kent, Lord Mountbatten, and Prince Charles. It's the German Hubert Harner deputizing for Hobbs in Gartland's Falcon in pole position. Gardner leads on the first lap, while Hanna and Muir sort themselves out. Rallyman Roger Clark, driving the number two man escort, had a big moment with Brian Robinson at Hawthorne's on the first time round, and both of them went off into the trees. Neither of them hurt. on the outside going into paddock trying to get past Gardner. A move that didn't quite come off. Muir closes up and tries the inside coming up into Druids and that doesn't come off either. It's still Gardner in the incredible little Ford Escort number 35 streaking away. There's Muir through going into paddock past Hana and setting out to see if he can catch Gardner. The rest of the field still sorting their way around each other as the 20 lap race over the 2.6 mile Kentish circuit gets underway. The championship battle is still between Gardner and Muir at this halfway stage in the season. Muir tries the outside at the south bank and that doesn't work. Alongside on the top straight and into paddock, there's a terrific puff of tire smoke as the Falcon locks a brake. Another manoeuvre that didn't quite come off. Muir really is trying everything. Hana watches the action from a safe third place. But out on the back straight, Muir gets through and pulls away into the lead. And Hana also outs Gardner from second place at Paddock Bend. That braking manoeuvre at Paddock, where Muir locked a brake, was to have drastic repercussions. On the 12th lap, he locked his brakes again with disastrous results and did an instant conversion from driver to spectator. Behind the leaders, the rest of the pack is fighting furiously, with minis, imps and escorts all trying to outdo each other. Gardner having overtaken Hana and now leading pulls steadily away. And there's the flag for the 37 year old Australian after a tactically handled race. A quick look around the track with someone else at the wheel for the winner. A leg up the championship ladder for Frank and a great showing for the escort. Winning an international race outright within six months of its introduction is something that most manufacturers dream of when they launch a new model. Nick Britton spoke to Frank Gardner and asked him his views on modern saloon cars. Saloon cars these days have got quite exotic like 
Formula One cars, the suspension, and you think of them as a Formula One car, they're no longer really such a compromise as they have been in the past. You must set a car up quite intelligently, go for rigidity, deflection in your chassis, uh, as much as you can spend in getting them rigid as a Formula One car. Frank, if somebody wanted to buy a car like yours, a 200 horsepower Escort from Alan Mann, how much would it cost? Nick, I should think you could immediately start thinking in the re region of about 5,000 pounds, I would have thought. As much as that? Well, yes, I would have thought with the hours and the expensive equipment, the cost of labour these days, I would have thought four to 5,000 pounds, no trouble at all. The actual engine on its own, how much is that worth? 2,200 pounds. Fulton Park now for the Gold Cup meeting. The cost for this performance, very much the same as at Brands. Fulton is the nearest thing we have in England to a true road circuit. Two and three quarter miles of twists, turns, rises and falls. The front row, Charles Lucas in Paddy McNally's Porsche, Gardner, and Graham Hill on pole with a slightly supercharged man escort. A wet practice session put the lighter, more nimble cars on the front row, whilst the less acrobatic Falcons lurked on the third, fifth and tenth rows. Now let's talk to Charles Lucas. Charles, we're more used to seeing you at the wheel of a vintage Maserati or a Formula 3 car. Um, what brought you into saloon car racing? Um, uh, old mate of mine called Paddy McNally brought me in, actually. Uh, took me out for a lunch the other day up in the city, and as he couldn't pay his share of the bill, I said, Paddy, look, how about letting me have a drive in your Porsche up at Alton Park? So he said, great, you know, get him off the hook. Tell me, Charles, in your first time out in the car, how did you qualify it during practice? I don't know, perhaps my grandfather or something was up in the time box, but we got a very good time, which put it on the front row, which um, is going to be pretty good hell, actually, because you know, all the quick lads, the falcons and everything, are going to be behind, and, you know, eyes glued to the mirror as Porsche gets whipped past down the street. Still, give it a, give it a bash. They're away, and Gardner streaks into the lead, closely followed by Graham Hill. Muir shook off a gaggle of minis and was soon in third place. By Asso Bend, he moved into second place, and by the time they got to Nickerbrook, he was in the lead. Frank Gardner tells us his way around Dalton. Or in Ireland Bend, I keep it in top gear all the way there, actually dying away to about seven, eight in top gear for the last part of Ireland Bend and scratching for the outside of the road and trying to get the weight off the car to give me a good line into Esso. I scratch into Esso rather untidily, pretty untidy anyway. Make Esso with about 45 degrees of attitude on to have a good look at the inside of the track. A very tight corner, I'm back in second gear with around about 8.5 on the rev counter at the apex of the corner again and climbing up towards nine, picking up third gear really before leaving the corner, accelerating in fourth and picking up top, running up to the hump in the back straight. Hill with a puncture accepts condolences from Bonnier. Roy Pierpoint, with his re-sprayed red falcon, a change of colour and a change of good fortune, takes up the chase. Muir still in the lead, with Hobbs chasing, but Muir holds him off and wins another round in the Saloon Car Championship. We asked Muir about his car. It's a Falcon, one of the Monte Carlo Rally Falcons, 1963, I think they started to produce them. And uh, it's got a Westlake head, uh, Westlake heads fitted to a 427 engine, produces about 400 horsepower. And it's got the front suspension suited to be modified, and the back suspension suited to be modified, yeah. and the brakes suited to be modified. What sort of speed are you doing at the fastest point on the circuit here at Alton? On this circuit, we'd be approaching 140, 135, 140. Hmm. In this afternoon's race, which uh, you won, did you have any real drama in the race? Well, the, the brakes weren't as nice as I'd like them to have been, but apart from that, the car ran very well. Hmm. And how does this leave you in the championship at the moment? Well, I think we've lost our grip. Uh, Frank Gardner is uh, about 14 points ahead, and there's two more rounds to go, so this leaves uh, us a possible 16 points, but Frank can also get 16, so I don't think there's much chance from now on. Another important aspect of any race meeting are the marshals. Nick Syrett, secretary of the BRSCC, spoke about them. It takes more than drivers to make a motor race. At this sort of meeting, we've got over 150 marshals on duty. 
flag marshals, course marshals, observers, all linked to race control. They're responsible men, all specially trained, in whose hands lie the safety of drivers and spectators. They all work on a voluntary unpaid basis and without them there would be no motor racing. They do a terrific job. It's Brands again for the September International. Muir shares the front row with his big rivals, the 200 horsepower escorts. And there's a terrific shunt there on the line. One of the minis touches the rear of Bahrain's Falcon and it's like a metal concertina at work. Bahrain left facing the oncoming traffic and Muir leaps into the lead. Busy marshals clear the track, humping the disabled cars of Fitzpatrick, Bax and Hickman to safety. You're leading, but behind him the escorts and Pierpoint's Falcon are flexing their muscles, preparing to pounce. Only the front runners like Muir and Gardner and half a dozen others in this field are full-time professionals. The others, and there are over 20 of them, are amateurs. Some of them running cars that could almost be used for normal transport on the roads. Almost. Some of them will have cars valued at as little as 1,500 pounds. Others will have anything up to 5,000 pounds tied up in theirs. But saloon car racing is one class of motorsport where the amateur and professional can meet to do battle. And occasionally the amateur even wins. But at least the opportunity is there for the clubman to share a grid and race with people like, like Graham Hill, Frank Gardner and Brian Muir. No other sport offers this. Imagine playing football in the same team as Bobby Charlton if you were a soccer amateur. This is probably the reason that saloon car racing is becoming increasingly more popular with spectators. We asked John Webb, managing director of motor circuit developments, for his views on this. Saloon car racing has most certainly attracted more people to the sport. When I used to compete myself about 12 years ago, the saloon car race in, a, in any program was the poor relation. We didn't have any work supported cars. In fact, we all used to drive our own saloon cars to work from Monday to Friday have a quick service on Saturday morning, drive the car to the track, and compete in perfectly standard form. Even mild engine tuning was virtually unknown in those days. As far as I can remember, lap record times were in the region of 71 seconds at Brands Hatch. Um, now they're down to 56 seconds. Lotus Formula One recruit Jackie Oliver is driving the second escort in this event. Number 207. A small fan blower is fitted to this engine, which effectively categorizes it as supercharged thus moving it up into the same class as the Falcons. A man's plan here is to try and finish Oliver in front of Muir, thus making absolutely certain that Gardner's points advantage in the championship can't be better. Pierpoint now firmly in the lead with Oliver hounding Muir. And the man plan looks as if it might work. They look quite graceful as they go a little slower, don't they? In waltz time. But also you can see that Muir, Oliver and Gardner are now right on Pierpoint's heels. And still Oliver is pressing Muir as they go round Druids. distance and it's still Pierpoint leading but Jackie Oliver has passed Muir and is chasing him hard. The black flag for Len Ward's Anglia, a trailing exhaust. Point wins with Jackie Oliver second, Muir third, and Gardner fourth after 20 laps of changing fortunes. 
Although there is still one race to go in the series, that fourth place and a comfortable class win gives Gardner the championship with a point score that Muir can't beat. Here points, former British champion and a plant hire contractor from Surrey, the victor. That change of colour scheme, blue to red, really does seem to have changed his luck. October the 20th and Brands Hatch again for the Guards Motor Show 200 meeting. The last one of the year in the championship series. Another international entry with cars from Sweden, Holland and Germany pitting themselves against the best of the British tin toppers. This time for a 50 lap thrash around the demanding 2.6 mile Grand Prix circuit. Weaving and jostling away from the grid, they form a high-speed traffic jam as they crest the rise to Paddock Bend with Muir once again leading. Unfortunately, Brian had trouble in practice with a broken crankshaft damper. And although it was repaired, there were doubts about the crank itself being able to last the race. Pierpoint and Gardner in that order, and Muir has already retired with a broken engine. That crank didn't last the first lap. With the championship title secure, Gardner's boss, Alan Mann, had given him permission to go for a win or bust. No need to worry about the class win or playing it safe. And this was the sort of instruction Frank enjoyed accepting. Frank treated himself, Alan Mann and the crowd to a fine display of saloon car racing at its best hitting his wits and his 200 horsepower against 400 horsepower Falcons. Red, white and blue Porsche number 10 driven by Dutchman Toyne Hazemans who we saw at Snatterton with the little Fiat Arbor. His car has the powerful Carrera 10 engine. And as usual the minis giving the crowd a display of close jostling. The inevitable queue as they line up for the approach to Hawthorns. And already the leaders are getting amongst the back markers. Watch Roy Pierpoint go up the outside. Hobbs on the inside as they come up to Paddock and... No, uh, something's happened. Smoke and grinding metal and Ken Costello ricocheting off. Fortunately, Ken's all right, but that accident put Pierpoint's fork out as well. Both Hobbs and Gardner got through. There's no let up now. Gardner really hammering away at the rear of the Gulf-sponsored Falcon. The spectators really enjoying the show, including the greater crested variety in the tree up there. At last, Gardner has found a way past the bulky Falcon. Now he's off in search of a new lap record he promised himself before the start. Not just a class record, but the outright one. Fitzpatrick and Kraft running nose to tail well ahead of the rest of the 1300cc class and having a private race of their own. Gardner goes into his last lap. Escorts are becoming more and more popular on the circuits now. And there it is, the checkered flag for the end of the race the end of the season, and the end of another championship trail. Frank Gardner, for the second year, is the British saloon car champion. Keith Green, man's team manager, tells Frank what he wants to know. A new outright saloon car record. So with the championship, Frank also becomes the fastest ever saloon driver around the Kentish circuit with a new average of 89.4 miles per hour. Gardner, Mann and Ford obviously delighted to see the car they launched just nine months ago win the coveted British title.